Dear students and colleagues, uh, welcome to the, this edition of the Innovation Talks of the Lumsa University in Rome. Innovation Talks are 10 weekly webinars uh, aimed to discuss innovation, technology, sustainability, and the future of business in society with experts and opinion leaders in the business community. Uh, these webinars are organized by the Department of Law, Economics, Policy, and Modern Languages uh, of LUMSA and Master's Degree in Management and Finance in partnership with the Association of Alumni LUMSA. I'm Filippo Giordano and I'm the Program Director of the Master's Degree in Management and Finance in LUMSA. Uh, in, the, in this uh, seventh webinar, uh, we talk about impact entrepreneurship. So how entrepreneurship can improve, uh, can improve the, the, the life of people, the social inclusion. So how entrepreneurship can have an impact in uh, our society. And uh, we will talk uh, uh, about this issue with uh, what I consider a serial social entrepreneur probably an influencer in the field uh, of uh, social impact and social entrepreneurship, that is uh, Lorenzo Di Ciaccio. But uh, I leave the floor to my colleagues. Um, ecco, Lorenzo is, uh, is already with us. I leave the floor um, to my colleagues, uh, Domenico Nesci, that is our professor of venture capital. So it's also a, an addicted of uh, social entrepreneurship and impact entrepreneurship. Uh, and impact investing also. So I leave the floor to Domenico to introduce the topic of today and our guest. Thanks, Domenico. Thank you very much, Filippo. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so we have uh, the pleasure and the honor to have with us uh, Lorenzo Di Ciaccio today. Uh, is actually, Lorenzo is a, a, a strong technologist. He used to work for Intel, no, sorry, for Texas. And um, he decided to go uh, for entrepreneurship and to set up a company uh, whose name is Pedius uh, that uh, uh, you will see that uh, has a huge impact on, uh, on uh, end user of uh, its service. So, um, so an impact company basically is a company that um, has uh, uh, two objectives. One objective that is the traditional one is to, uh, to make profits, but also another objective that is uh, to make, uh, to, to be impactful in what, uh, in what it does. And um, uh, impact actually uh, started a number of years ago, but now is becoming more and more popular uh, especially on the environmental side of it, uh, but also on the social side of it because of uh, the COVID crisis. So I would say that having Lorenzo uh, today with us uh, allows us to uh, get a better understanding on what it means to be on the frontier of uh, being an impactful uh, entrepreneur. So uh, welcome again, Lorenzo, uh, to the show. Uh, happy to have you with us, and uh, I leave you the floor. So um, the schedule is uh, uh, approximately 30, 35 minutes of speech, and then we will okay. move to some questions. OK? Yep. Yep, of course. Definitely Thank fine. You. Thanks for, for the fantastic. You used to work for Texas or. And it was Intel. You, you, you say it right. It was Intel. Ah, it was Intel. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> okay. So thanks for the fantastic uh, introduction and even even too much of what we uh, I deserve. So, um, as uh, Domenico said, uh, I have an IT background. So I'm a computer science engineer. And I used to work as a consultant from different industry, from uh, telemedicine. The, my last project was uh, uh, relating automotive with Intel. So, but um, you know, I will start more in um, the reason why how people became an entrepreneur. There are a lot of theories. There is to be an entrepreneur, you must have some risk attitude that is over the average, but also you need to have the the spark that ignite the entrepreneurs are inside you. 
So I, during my career as employees, I was considering, okay, probably one day I will have my own company. So I, I will see this kind of future for my, for my person, but I never have uh, imagined wh where I am now. So it was pretty impossible. If, if talked to the Lorenzo 10 years ago, I have no clue what uh, I was going to do now. So I have prepared a short presentation just to make it more interactive. But of course, um, if you want to make some questions, so I would like to be very interactive because this is the, the difference between uh, uh, a video recorded and the live event. So if you have any question, if something is not clear, uh, I would be more than happy to repeat or, no, or clarify. So what does my company do is enabling phone calls for deaf and hard of hearing. So the story, let me share the screen. Um, don't show the and screen. Should be this one. So the solution, as is, phone calls for deaf and hard of hearing people. So the fun fact is that I never met a deaf person before, like uh, eight years ago. So I probably have seen someone in the somewhere, but I, I never interact. I have no friends, no relatives that are deaf. So the story was uh, on the TV, the national TV, it was the story of Gabriele. Uh, now he is my friend, but at the moment it was a, a, an unknown person. He had a car accident and he was unable to call an ambulance in the tow truck because he's deaf. And the idea that uh, for me that I was working in the technology, so the idea that a deaf person cannot make a phone call in case of emergency was absurd. It was, sounds shocking for me. And so we started making some research and, and really the fact was that the deaf people cannot make a phone call. There are a special service named a relay service. There are a special call center where the deaf person can use sign language to talk with an interpreter and the interpreter will place the call on behalf of him. So imagine how complicated it can be in case you are in a hurry or you, or, or maybe if you do not know sign language because not all the deaf people know sign language. So that is uh, not only calls for emergency are the biggest issues. There are a lot of offices, especially today with this pandemic, a lot of interaction has moved online. So there are a lot of webinar, even this webinar, if, if people are deaf, cannot follow the webinar uh, and, and, and there is part of our education. So call centers, even call a plumber could be a problem if you are hearing impaired. So that's the, the, the idea was, uh, it was already in our mind, we only have to define how to go to the market and how to embrace this challenge. So in, this, in the society, we have the idea of the ramp to avoid the steps for the architectural barrier, but in a digital world, we must be aware also of the digital barriers that technology may create. An example is the touch screen was a kind of nightmare for blind people because they were able to use the phone with a physical keyboard because they can fill the, 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 every button with a finger. But now with the touch screen is much more complicated until the voice control became simpler again. So there are some change. Every innovation may bring some new barriers. So in this case, what we can invent for the phone. And this was our solution, it was an app that transformed a chat in a phone call using text-to-speech and voice recognition technology. So basically, the user type a message on the phone and there is a real phone call going on on the other side. And there is a, an artificial voice reading the message and in real time, every sentence pronounced is converted or converted to text so the deaf person can read it. So it's a very simple and effective way to interact and the problem was not only that the, people, that the biggest need is not to call their friends because you can send a text to your friends. The problem came when you have to call companies and uh, when you, you, you cannot use the a text in this way, or maybe you need a, re a really uh, fast interaction. So I, I, I want to focus too much on the technology because this is, of course, it's not a tech course, but I, I would like to focus more on the journey, how to become an entrepreneur, because the difference between the social entrepreneur and entrepreneur are very, very similar. There's not bigger, probably being social entrepreneur is a, a little bit harder because you can, you have to, so you have more constraints in this game, let's say. But I would like to tell more the evolution, uh, um, how I became an entrepreneur. So in, in, if this can be of 
bring any inspiration for you. Uh, basically, these three big challenges are pretty much common for every entrepreneur. So the first challenge, so was uh, I was 20, 27 years old and I got this idea. So I realized that, of course, uh, we need help to develop a product. And uh, I would start um, searching for um, for fun. Uh, it was uh, now there are only one accelerator in Rome. It was Hand Labs. Now it's merged with Louis Hand Labs. It was much bigger, but at that moment the ecosystem was very very young, pretty pretty inexistent. So there is only one place where you can pitch and present your idea, asking for money to the investor. So uh, imagine uh, me at 27 years old telling to the audience, uh, "I would like to develop a, a phone company for the deaf." That was the they start laughing, really laughing at me because if come on, you you won't call a phone company for deaf. How you would call it? Um, deaf phone. Instead, making a joke on the on the um, on the name of the company, and I was really uh, surprised that they, they didn't get the point. And this is one of the common mistakes, especially for the um, tech uh, tech founder. And this uh, this process is named more as. Um, the course knowledge course so when you really know something more you know a topic and more hard is to explain to people that doesn't have knowledge and we are experiencing this now with a lot of topics starting from vaccines from uh, politics every complex things require a very strong knowledge to discuss but when you talk with someone that doesn't have this knowledge it's very hard to communicate so in that moment, in my mind, I already have the app in my mind. So for me, it was very easy to develop. But for people, a phone company for deaf people sounds absurd. So then when you have a university that you don't pass, you fail an exam, what do you do? You go back home and, and you start study again to re repeat the exam. In, the, in entrepreneurial life, uh, there is not study harder. You have to find answer practically. So I cannot find a better way to, to tell a uh, phone company for deaf people. I need to prove that it could work. So in their mind, it was, this is impossible to work. So the answer was, let's develop a prototype. Let's, let's develop it. And then our answer was, after six months of development, this was the, our answer. We create a beta with 100 users. And Monica was one of the lucky users that was benefiting of our better program. She was pregnant. She, well, she was feeling sick at home. And she used our app to call the doctor. Then, uh, of course, the doctor came and visited her. It was nothing serious. But she wrote an email, a wonderful email, that we still have in our office as a memory. This is our first uh, salary. Because this is one of the biggest things when, when you are um, when you are startup, when you are be trying to become an entrepreneur, when you're doing something great, the first thing you have to think when you wake up in the morning is why I am I doing this? Why The why of your day, the why of your month, the why of your year, and this is your mission. And that was uh, our why, because uh, believe me, changing the lifestyle from having a, a US salary and living in Rome then from having no salary and start counting again the money that you have in your bank account, making projection, it was kind of sad because I, I didn't have any problem managing my money because, of course, when you have uh, no family, you just live alone, you have a, a nice salary, there is no problem. But then when you, ha when you have no entrance, you only have your, your piggy bank that is just decreasing day by day. Of course, when you are investing money in a company, uh, the expenditure are much, much higher than, than ha even having a, a child. So that was the story of Monica and was very, um, was very happy to be part of uh, uh, this small success. We got the attention on some media. And then after that, we went back to the, to the investor because you, you didn't believe that the company, that the phone company for that could exist. Now we made it, and we also already helped one person, and we have a wonderful news uh, a newspaper. But then the answer was that one. Nice, nice idea, but no company will pay for that. For that. So, what is uh, what is the meaning? This is the in one word. Probably you already have heard this word. It's a business model. 
So how you think this could be sustainable? Because of course we have done something beautiful, something nice, something helpful, but how you manage to scale up to, to keep it sustainable? And we were very lucky in that moment because we won um, one competition of a, one business plan competition uh, named a global social venture competition promoted by the University of Berkeley. And uh, we went there uh, studying for the first time what is the real uh, the meaning of social entrepreneurship and social business. And there are a lot of business model that doesn't require a very intense commercial activity, but um, you need to find the one that works for your company. I make an example. The first thing we were, uh, first idea was, okay, we can do like Wikipedia. So Wikipedia is a donation base, it's a foundation. So we can uh, create a, a foundation to help deaf people uh, make phone calls. And that was pretty nice as idea, but then we realized that Wikipedia is the fifth website, most visited website in the world. And they are always struggling to get money because they, they need to uh, beg a lot. It's not that easy for them to, to raise money. And they are the fifth most visited website. We are targeting a niche. And firstly, uh, likely deaf people are not that common. Approximately uh, one every 1,000. So we are talking about a niche market. And you cannot use a business model like the one made from Wikipedia that is designed for a larger scale of people for worldwide. Uh, you cannot scale, use this business model for a niche market like us. Then, um, uh, we started figuring out uh, who who gonna pay this. So who have to pay that? There are a lot of questions. Uh, if is is legit that the deaf person has to pay the phone call? This is partially true, partially not, because it sounds very unethic asking money to be deaf, and this is how it's perceived, especially in this the mindset of deaf in the deaf culture is very conservative, is very assistive. So I am disable i need the help of someone else this is the old mindset but now something is changing and when we are making the pricing we decide to do a philosophical pricing so how much we we ask ourselves this question how much a deaf person should pay to make phone call any answer i need to exit the screen to see if there is any no answer. No one. No one wants to answer this question. Too difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I would say a very easy way. The the right amount is the same as other people. So, what is the regular price? Why deaf people uh, has to pay more than than regular? And this is the real meaning of accessibility. So having everybody in the position to buy the same service, the same product. But of course, the niche market is still a big limit because we have a lot of fixed costs. So we started working on those numbers. But then the biggest idea is who has to pay, generally, who is paying the ramps for the steps? It's not the, the wheelchair owner, it's the, it's the building, it's the company. And that was our idea. So we, we try um, talking with the company and say, you have, if you have a call center, you know you are cutting out uh, one part of your customer, the deaf customer. And then companies are very, we found some companies that have different sensibility and they see some opportunity, sometimes for communication, sometimes for um, corporate social responsibility. There are different drivers, especially also in the in the using technology is something cool it will be very well communicated and that was the answer after like almost two years of negotiation this is one screenshot from um a commercial made by telecom italia now his name team because they they use our software to make their call center accessible so deaf people can call uh, telecom italia using padius and they made a tv commercial and the text says, the team helps the um, company to grow. That is the, the, um, the message. And they also the budget of our product was paid by the communication, the marketing budget. So they decide this is a very nice idea. Probably it doesn't bring more money because deaf, the deaf community is very small, but we can give a very powerful message to all the other users. And that is the, our business model. 
So we start selling the companies a solution uh, but that they have very low impact on their infrastructure. So that was our, uh, say, secret ingredient. So we make things easy for even for large enterprise. Of course, large enterprises like that. And um, with Telecom Italia, we had also other companies, other banks. But then uh, this is probably the toughest moment uh, of, of my career, at least uh, financially speaking. Because when you have an agreement with such a big company, it means that uh, you are in the process to deliver a high quality standard because there are a lot of complaints. You, you cannot fail. And the risk is also that they are not paying uh, as, you, as you start. The terms of payment generally are very, very long. In this case, we were 120 days after the delivery. That means that we have to deliver a high standard quality software service uh, for uh, at least four months before getting money. So we started uh, investing all, all of our money for that and it was uh, an, in the provision to get the big contract. But of course, we need capital to scale up. And once we had one of the biggest call center in Italy, we, we consider, okay, this is the moment to go back to the investor because now we, we, we show that we have potential to, to, um, to sell the product. So we answer to the guy, to this uh, guy over the cigar. But of course, this is the, the, the last challenge was, was even tougher because we, um, I think we don't have enough time to go into details, but my, my situation was this one. I got a minus 20,000 euros on my personal account. I got my car confiscated and um, I didn't pay the rent for four months because I ended all the money. I, I had um, a small savings when I started the company because, okay, this is my piggy bank. And in case everything goes bad, I can use this money to uh, pay the expenses to live in Rome and then find a job without having to accept the first job that, that, that I found. So that is the, the idea. But when we get so close to the, to the big deal, I use this money for the company. So I also find a way to get some depth and, and go even deeper with my bank account. So in that moment, uh, we were talking with the, a lot of investors, but the negotiation was very long until one day we receive an email, with long story short, um, we got an invite to meet one person named Brian Cohen. And Cohen is that surname of the movie family. It's a very rich family. And Mr. Brian uh, was managing an um, investor fund of $9 billion. And he was uh, investing every year almost $100 million of personal wealth. He was one of the first investors of Twitter, Pinterest. is considered like the, the king media of the startups. Because when he put some money in the project, other company, other investor believe in his uh, feeling, in the gut feeling, and they put money. So even if a project doesn't work with tons of money, it should become something great. And this is the example of Twitter, because Twitter was not profitable for years before they find a way to make money. So we, we had the meeting with this guy at New York. That was the biggest, the, the small problem. We had to, we spent the last money we had with a credit card to buy the flight ticket and, met, uh, and meet um, Brian in the bar. And the meeting was very, very, say, emotional. So before uh, my turn, there was another person who was um, um, a manager and he was already uh, running a company that was um, with, a, with a almost one, one million and a half euros in revenue every year. And he just made one question to him. He asked, what's he holding back? And he was start thinking, this guy was thinking, it was counting like, the the judge in the, in the box ring is a one, two, three, and after three seconds, he started yelling at him. He say, uh, "You, why you are wasting my time? You are sitting at this table for more than three seconds, and you don't know why your company is not making money, and you want my money to 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 help you get out of here and pay the bills of the coffee because you don't deserve nothing from me." And then it's, "Oh, Mr. Bichacho, it's your turn." That is the the, the moment. And I realized laterly that uh, Mr. Cohen was using a technique called cherry picking. That means uh, when you have to evaluate a lot of different products, because 
uh, you have to evaluate the next Twitter, maybe the cure for the cancer, the time machine. You have so many things. You cannot have a strong knowledge for everything. So the only way you have to prove at least uh, if a project is fake or not is to prepare one single question, maybe very specific, and you can maybe Google it and get prepared and try to make this question. So then you have two alternatives. If the person doesn't know the answer, you can blame on it and, and, and kick it out. If not, of course, it doesn't prove that the project is good, but at least you have some person, you have a way to test, even if you are not in a great knowledge in that field. So in my case, the cherry picking question was, why in the state of Ohio, there are much more, not much more, but are more deaf than other countries, other states. And at that moment, my heart was pumping because, uh, of course, before doing my whole lean, I spent the, the, the weeks and almost uh, all the time studying something specifically from the US market. And I know that that answer was very simple, was just due to regulation because we consider deaf in the state of Ohio require a lower level. So that means if you lower the threshold of deafness, you have more people that enter in. So that was simple, but of course you, you have to know a very particular. So I probably, I was lucky to read this part and he was very happy to see that. So you are the first person today that uh, was very well prepared in the market and, and uh, in entering in this market. But there was also a but. No one, it was the president of the business angel in, in New York. And he say, no one, and no, no, no business angel in New York or my team have ever invested in disability. My face was, you can be the first one and then forget about it because my job is not investing in this field because uh, my power is that people believe in my gut feeling and when I put money, other people put other money and this would be the real power. In your case, your business is too small for me. Even if your company will uh, reward like 20 million, if I give you 1 million today, uh, I don't have a, for 20 million is my best result I can have at the end. And this is not my, uh, this should be my average. It's not, uh, I cannot invest in a project that at maximum can give me this, this uh, return. And then it was very sad moment because, uh, you know, when you are feel so close to reach the goal and then you get uh, so dumped in this way. And so that, that day was just to keep the mood of uh, the downside of the entrepreneur. Uh, that day, they, they realized that I was making this debt uh, with my credit card. They blocked my credit card and we still uh, we stay for three days in New York with only $19. That was uh, one part of the funny story. And we, we couldn't have the money to buy a beer, to pay the, the beer the, that day just to keep up the mood and we have to say to the bar owner, oh, please, <laughs> we don't have any, enough money to pay the, the bill. But there were always a but, not all the investors uh, are equals. And the, the work of, an, uh, of a founder is to find the right one. So that meeting was, was fantastic from my experience, but now I know that Mr. Cohen will have never invested in Padius because now I know how investor thinks, how, how they plan to make money. And our answer was this one, the person that you see here in the middle, those are my three founder, Lorenzo Stefano Alessandro, and the person with the gray hair is Salvo Mizzi, that at the moment was the, um, the CEO of um, Telecom Italia Ventures. It was the uh, venture capital, the corporate venture capital of Telecom Italia. So we were looking for other kinds of investor, like a corporate investor, that they are not looking for a great return in the short terms, but they are seen as a successful project and maybe some project that is related with the industry and it would best, best fit than a Pedius, a company for deaf people. There was a field where telecommunication uh, always have excluded deaf people. So that it was the first round made with uh, 400,000 euros. And the second round was always signed by Salvo because he moved in another venture fund. And, uh, and we closed a deal with uh, Principia in Italia and Telecom Italia again for 1.4 million euros. And that's money was the money we used to scale up and go in uh, 
that in 14 countries with more than 30, now it's 35,000 users. And those are some of the companies that are using our service all over the world. So that is the business model uh, keep working. And with those injection of capital, we were able to scale up, uh, scale up the process. And that is the, 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 the key feature was developing a technology that has a very low impact on the, on the company and infrastructure. So they cannot say no. And that it was our, our, our I say, secret ingredient for the success. This is just one example of how uh, the roadside assistance uh, can be um, called, the tow truck can be called using our app. So we navigate in the, in the, um, the phone menu of the um, call center and we pre-fill all the data. I would like to, to talk with a, a lot of technical things. The last aspect that was very important for the, um, especially in the last year, was the work inclusion. Because after considering about the, um, the customer, we are considering the deaf employees. And this was much easier sale because if you have a deaf person in your team, you are not using 100% uh, of his energy, probably even less than 50%. And when you enable the people uh, making phone calls, it can be a huge, a huge result. And this is the story of Fabio. This is a little bit low quality picture, but is Fabio was um, now maintenance engineer, uh, and now he became a team leader. The the big stop for his career, you are deaf, you cannot make a call, you cannot uh, manage a team. But when he discovered Padius, you know, I can now, because I can make a phone call, I can use Padius, I can attend a meeting, even in English, because he was a, a, a genius. Even if he was deaf, he was able to get two degrees and MBA. Now he's still, um, when he got the access to the conferencing and with the caption, the company has no excuse to promote him. And it was one example that we uh, bring as the power of um, technology. They can um, say um, the empowerment of the people. And that is, so when you talk about social business, is is probably that, that side that I would like to mention most is thinking as thinking as a company, but solving the social issues. So the biggest problem that we have in, in the society is that we have the no profit and we have for profit. And we think that social codes are only made by no profit, while the profit company, they only have to think about profit. Of course, this is changing. Now there are a lot of, I say, uh, cosmetics like corporate social responsibility, something that is trying to move the business, but it could be, it's not seen sometimes is wrongly seen as a limiting the business capability because I need to help the society. If you consider like a petrol, an oil company, an oil company is making a lot of money, but in their balance at the end, nobody put the environment impact. If we have to consider in the, in the balance sheet of every year, the damage and the environmental impact that the business causes in the, in the planet, probably, they are not that so profitable company. And also there are a lot of social codes that are not evaluated as, um, as a valuable as a money because we have in the finance, um, we are used to consider only money, but there are a lot of hidden costs and also some different way to evaluate the value. I make an example with a, with a, um, with a jail, the prison, the system, you know, one prisoner costs the states more than 40,000 euros. So one solution could be, okay, I give 1,000 euro for each prisoner. I say, okay, you are out, behave, behave well. In this case, I have saved like uh, um, 20, 28,000 euros for each uh, prisoner. Of course, this, this model doesn't work because there is not the any incentive to do not iterate the crime. But financially speaking, this is a huge impact because the, company, the government may save a lot of money. So if you find a way to reduce and prove that there are less prisoner, less day in jail, thanks to some project, some idea, maybe a program, uh, an education program that reduce the, the return rate of people that are committing crime, this can be properly paid is technically are saving money, 
the government is saving money. Why they could not reinvest the money in some project? So this is the aspect that I think that the, the, mm, the process behind social entrepreneurship and regular entrepreneurship are just the same. You are only with social enterprise, you're only considering a much wider scope. And you can see problem where uh, other people doesn't see, and you can see opportunity where other people see problem. And in our case, the, using the, the use of technology was transforming what was a problem for the society. There are the deaf people that needs to be assisted by the government. In our case, it became a business that was giving workplace um, new jobs and also empowering people like like Fabio. So this is a definitely win-win-win situation. But of course, to enable these things, it's required a lot of investment. It's like any company; you have to invest money to get the result. In the social business, it's the same process: you invest money and you get two results: the financial result and the economical result and the, the social result. So that is, in the, in the one sentence, is social, social business think as a company uh, with business logic, solving so, social issues with business logic and make it sustainable and also attractive for investor. So I think this is my, my, my 30 minutes is almost over. And if you, yeah, if we are. have a, if you have any question, if you want going deep in some aspect, I'm more than happy to, to yeah. do that. Um, my my first question. Thank you very much, Lorenzo, for your exciting presentation. As usual, I need to say, uh, very good speaker. Um, so uh, my first question would be: uh, You are uh, Pedius is an impact company, so. How do you consider your relationships in this respect, your relationships with uh, your investors? So do investors understand uh, this double mission of uh, impact companies or they tend to focus on the financial aspects? So what are the black and whites of, uh, of uh, being a, an impact company? Because yeah, you I'm have sure. a institutional, standard investors in your company so you can tell us about it yeah exactly so in the first round was what the impact aspect was more perceived because we have the enterprise that doesn't that was one of the first investment of telecom italia so they were not looking for high return they, they, they were looking for a nice project they are more for communication and that we are perfect a perfect match for them then we have another investor who was a more um, a wealthy person that it was finding something different. It was getting close to the startup board and he liked the idea. But of course, he doesn't have any sp specific knowledge in, uh, in impact investment. And the other one was also an, um, a startup investor and he see potential, but was convinced by uh, the financial aspect. So definitely, uh, the social impact was very uh, as, a, as a very small impact in the beginning. We were also very uh, very unlucky to be born in in a process in a moment where there is no specific regulation in this topic. There was no much awareness in what is the social investment. There were probably there was just one venture, social venture fund and was uh, was ultra venture, and they were only investing in. Uh, old standard business like they were building hospitals and they're building more they're not financing startups so we, we try to get in touch with them of course we are not in their target now things are changing a little bit but the biggest risk for uh, since the mindset is still the dominant process is the finance mm, i say almost in every project the finance is the dominating aspect of course because if you don't have a good finance if you are not sustainable even your impact will suffer on that so our investors at the moment are very focused on finance, and we, we have some, so not problem with that, but it was very, at uh, the beginning, we have some friction explaining what are our mission and what they want. I make a practical example. We decide to go to China. And investors, okay, China is a very complicated market. Why you who wants to go to China? Do you have any specific uh, um, trick and <laughs> tips to go there? And our answer was one third of the population lives in China. If we are aiming to maximize our impact, 
we cannot stay out of China. We will find a way. Then, of course, the, the negotiation was, notice, we are trying to make the biggest impact possible, but they don't care that much. When we prove that we have some chance, when we got some contact, they got convinced and say, okay, go to China, but uh, invest moderately our money in that field because we don't believe that much in this project, especially for China. And this is in, in the in the jerk of um, social enterprises, this is called uh, the capital drift. Because, you know, Mohamed Yunus was uh, one of the first describers of social, social business. And in this 10 principle, he made this rule that the investor doesn't get money. So it doesn't get the reward. They only get the money back. And I was not, I still not convinced 100% of this process, but now at least I understood why he put this in the 10 principle. Because if you had one investor that is driven by money, the capital drift will drift your mission and will try to focus more on finance and, and revenues instead of impact. So for Yunus, this was a, a potential issue and he solved the issue in a very drastic way. So if you want money back, I will not give you money, more money than what you have invested. My vision is a slightly different because I believe that if you can give a, a reward, a fair reward to the investor, then you are able to raise more capital because otherwise you will only attract people that are investing money for philanthropy because of course you, you cannot make money on that. But our mission was to prove that you can make money, uh, uh, so you can be rich even doing good things. Probably you renounce to be a less richer, but you can still uh, make a profit. Of course, it's much difficult because you have different opinion and having a partner that is doesn't um, uh, understand this, this aspect is very complicated. One probably solution, and then I close my <laughs> the, the answer, is the solution for this aspect could be uh, probably the government, because the government can pay for the the solution that are not valuable in the in the, in immediately for the company. For example, if we solve the issue of the deaf people, how much money is the government pay paying for the deaf community today? So we can use more efficiently part of those money that are now give as, as a subsidiary help can be used as an entrepreneurial way to create more impact. So we can prove that if you give uh, one euro to Padius, you can have the impact of 10 euros helping the deaf community instead of just paying a service. And this process can be applied for any kind of uh, social problem from the poverty, from prison. This is the, the way I suggest you should think any sort of problem may have this dynamics behind. Yeah, thank you very much. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. In a way, <clears throat> as you are saying, uh, um, uh, public institutions can uh, cover that gap. Uh, there is uh, the gap between uh, expected returns and actual returns, in a way, mm -hmm. in different ways, of course. Um, another question is about mistakes. So when you set up a startup, when you make your entrepreneurial journey, uh, you don't always do the right things. Uh, at least at the moment you do them, you believe they are the right things to do. But then uh, retrospectively, you understand that uh, maybe uh, you could have done something differently. So can you uh, tell us uh, one or two things that uh, <clears throat> that are uh, uh, today, you would have done differently in Pedius. Yeah, a lot of things because, of course, <laughs> the project is made Just by a, a lot of mistakes. Yeah, uh, one way is, is related to the first aspect for the investment because we, when we raise money, uh, we uh, evaluate very badly the timing because uh, we, we, we went in the negotiation thinking that we can close the negotiation in six months, and we took one year. That was changing a lot of things because we are running out of cash. Uh, I had to, we, we closed the deal very in the last minute zone. It was the, the 29 December and we had the money just to pay the salaries of December. So I, I had to talk with all my employees and say, we are handling in a tough negotiation. And at the end, I said, at the end it was my fault because uh, it's nobody else. So we evaluated wrongly when you are in late, uh, you, you can blame the bus that doesn't came, that you can blame uh, 
others. But the only thing you can change is your, your behavior. So now I know that this process can be very long. And I, I, I was locked in in one single negotiation. So without having the chance to have a different opportunity open. So at the end, I got locked in, in this negotiation. And I had to talk with all my employees saying, sell, uh, saying that, uh, guys, we don't have money to pay the, your salary in January. So if you are staying today in the company, uh, you know that this is the risk. I can write a reference letter if you are, want to go away, especially with tech developers, it's very hard to find them. It's very easy to lose them. So that was one of very risky part. I got, we got lucky to close the deal in 29. December, but it was uh, all the, the chance are almost zero when 29 it was the Friday, so before the, the, the holiday. That was one of the biggest mistakes, probably the wrong timing in the in the fundraising uh, and uh, keeping one single process uh, with, with probably a low commitment because we were thinking, OK, we have to do our um, activity. So my job is not finding money. My job is to deliver the product. And it was another mistake because you have to take care of a different project. Probably I should have delegated more on some aspect or maybe the fundraising. So I, I don't know what I could do better uh, for those aspects, but definitely uh, I made something wrong in the timing. So I should start, at least I should start earlier. Yeah. And then another, another mistake is probably um, is um, probably we are still doing this mistake is the uh, defocus. So we are trying to open uh, different um, different projects all together. And I think this is also very risky when you are having some impact activity. Like we receive a lot of emails from uh, from India. And of course, India, uh, why you are not active in India? And we receive a very sad email. People need our service. So we are deciding, OK, let's try to make a pilot there. But then, of course, we are wasting energy. And probably we are not trying to our doing our best to launch a service in India. And at the moment, we have a kind of zombie project because we have a beta program like we have done in Italy. But since we are not investing the same energy, the project doesn't take off. And the thing is, we are, we are now considering things we have never done before to shut down the project. And if you consider even company like Google, they take the, the Google is very famous or be hard on this. So when they have some project that doesn't take off, they, they kill them. And this is probably one part of this missing now because we don't have the energy of Google. And if even Google is considering to, to shut down some project, it means that uh, we must keep the focus in, in very few aspects, especially if you don't have the power of these giants. Very good. So uh, first, uh, uh, there is the right time to start fundraising and fundraising, uh, as many says, as many say, is a full time activity. So you cannot do it uh, with your uh, with one end. And uh, the, the second one, uh, the second lesson is uh, lesson learned is uh, focus, focus, focus when you're a small company. So um, very last question, very easy to answer. So when you shave in the morning, sometimes you shave, not every day, probably. <laughs> not every day. <laughs> Just here in the, the morning, neck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> every now and then. Uh, when you shave in the morning, what is the thing that uh, you repeat yourself uh, that you want uh, to remember during the day about you being an entrepreneur? So what is your uh, strong motivation to do it? I think in one sentence is remember why. Remember why you are doing this. So and then I got every time I got some memory in some some user some some user story and, and also I, I can see the the vision of what we are doing the change that we are bringing in this society and the use of technology it is it's a kind of give back because I feel lucky that I had the chance to study and to access to this knowledge but a lot of deaf uh, people could not have the same access to education and probably nobody of them uh, can try to develop similar things because they, they couldn't have the chance. So I scan it when you are lucky is also, uh, I feel also responsible for giving back because if, if I had the chance to get this, uh, this goal, I need to share. I need to share my skill. I need to share my knowledge. So remember why would be. Yeah, remember why. 
So thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you very much. It has been very interesting. And um, uh, we wish you the best. I mean, we are sure that uh, Pedius will uh, keep growing and uh, will get where you want uh, where you want the company to be. So thank you very much. Uh, You're we welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, so, um, dear viewers, uh, we will uh, uh, get in touch again next Wednesday next Wednesday and uh, as far as I remember we will have Emilia Garito uh, talking to us about deep tech that is another uh, angle of uh, innovation so thank you very much everybody thank you very much Lorenzo mm -hmm. um, have a nice day bye 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 bye